Okay, we'll uh, get started. So all of you have this handout which I had distributed in the previous class? Do you have it? Okay, perfect. Uh, so we'll uh, talk about uh, jointly Gaussian random variables. So we were talking about joint distribution, marginal distribution and conditional distribution. Uh, in the previous class for continuous random variables. So we want to carry on the same discussion, but instead of talking about it in terms of general uh, probability density functions, we are now going to talk purely about jointly Gaussian random variables. So uh, I want to remind you of the expression that I had written in the class, yes, uh, in the, on Friday, so we have x, y, this is distributed according to mu x, mu y are the mean, sigma x x, sigma x y, sigma y x, sigma y y. That's my covariance matrix. And there were a few things we talked about in the context of Gaussian distribution. The first thing is you can characterize a Gaussian distribution, you can characterize the PDF of a Gaussian distribution just by knowing the mean and the covariance matrix. And the second part that we talked about was that uh, the distribution of y given x, so if you know what the value of x is, or if you know what the value of y is, if you look at the conditional distribution, so conditional is also Gaussian. So few facts that I mentioned, first is Gaussian distribution is characterized using its mean and covariance matrices. Second part that we talked about was conditional y given x is also Gaussian. So if I know the value of x and I want to look at the conditional distribution of y given x, that's also a Gaussian distribution. The third thing is x plus x and y are Gaussian. Jointly Gaussian. Then Ax plus By are also, is also Gaussian. For any, for A, for appropriate matrices. And for the second part, we know that expected value of y given x is mu y plus and covariance y given x is sigma y y minus sigma y x sigma x x inverse 
sigma x y. So these are things that we have already talked about. So you don't need to write it again. It was written in the previous lecture also. Uh, I'm just trying to recall all the stuff we discussed in the last class right now. Okay, so the first thing is we can characterize a Gaussian distribution using mean and covariance. What that means is if you know that a specific vector that you're looking at is Gaussian distributed, all you need to care about is what is its mean and what is its covariance and then you know exactly what the distribution of that random variable looks like. So it's characterized by the mean and covariance matrices. Um, the other important thing to note is if you, if you know that X and Y are jointly Gaussian, then Y given X, so if you know the value of X and you want to know what's the conditional probability distribution of Y is, it turns out it's also Gaussian. And because it's Gaussian, all you need to know is what is its mean and what is it the covariance. And once you know the mean and covariance, you exactly know what the distribution of Y given X, the conditional distribution of Y given X looks like. So what we had noticed in the previous class is that the conditional distribution of y given x, if you look at the mean, the mean is actually a linear function of x, okay? So if you break it down, what you get is sigma y x, sigma x x inverse x minus, no plus, mu y minus sigma x, sigma y x, sigma xx inverse mu x. So you have one matrix and you have another vector and you have the matrix gets multiplied by x and a vector gets added and that gives you the expected value of y given x. And the covariance matrix, remember we were talking about the fact that once you have more and more measurements, the covariance starts going down. So if you know a lot more about x, then this covariance is going to become smaller and smaller. <clears throat> okay, so the covariance always reduces once you know, once you have some information about X. Now, of course, the sometimes the covariance reduction is very high, sometimes the covariance reduction is very low. And we were talking about the vehicle velocity. So if you don't know, if you don't have any measurement from the vehicle, you don't exactly know what the velocity is. It could be zero miles per hour, it could be 100 miles per hour. So the covariance is very high in those cases. But if you have some knowledge about what the rotational speed of the vehicle's uh, four uh, wheels are, then you have a very good idea about what the velocity is going to be. If you have more information from the GPS sensor, then you can have much better estimate of what the velocity of the vehicle is, and so on and so forth, right? So what do you mean by a better estimate? What that means is that the covariance of Y given X is much, much smaller. So you start with a very high covariance matrix, and then as you get more and more measurement, the variance covariance becomes smaller. And then we say colloquially, we say that, okay, we have a better estimate of Y. Now the third thing is if X and Y are jointly Gaussian random variable uh, or random vectors and you look at the AX plus BY, so A is any matrix, I mean A is an appropriate matrix and B is an appropriate matrix, but the entries could be anything. The dimension has to be such that this particular operation is valid, AX plus BY is valid. So in that case, this is also a Gaussian random variable. What that means is all we need to know is what the what the mean and the covariance of this particular vector is. And once we know the mean and covariance, we exactly know what the distribution function is going to look like. Now, you know, many of the other uh, 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 things like uh, a uniform random variable and so on, when, you know, they don't satisfy all of these properties. So in some sense, Gaussian is very special because it satisfies a lot of these, uh, uh, there are a lot of other factors also that leads to why Gaussian distribution is a cool distribution. Uh, we are not going to get into uh, the nitty gritties of why it's a cool distribution, but for the purpose of this class, these are the three important factors which, uh, which is going to be used again and again during the entire, like until the end of the semester. The fact that you can characterize the Gaussian with the mean and covariance, the fact that conditional distribution is Gaussian, and any linear combination of uh, Gaussian distributed random vectors 
are also Gaussian. Okay. And another property that uh, if you look at the mean, the conditional mean of a of this Gaussian distributed random variable, it's actually linear in what is already known. It's a linear function of what is already known. So we'll see why some why some of these properties are important. In today's class, I hope I have the time to cover everything that I want to cover. Uh, but uh, but the first thing is I'm going to go over this uh, handout. Now I see that there are uh, people who have joined this class, but they weren't there in the final, in the Friday's class. So I don't know if you have the, have this uh, uh, sheet with you or not. It's there on Carmen. So if you are on tablet, please download it from Carmen. Uh, it's in the handout folder. And the, the handout is uh, on linear transformation of multivariate normal distribution. So. We'll be talking from this handout today. Uh, I don't want you to write the stuff that, well, you can write the stuff that I'm writing on the board, but actually all the expressions are here in this handout. So that's why I want you to just go through the handout while I'm writing on the board so that you can follow all the expression without spending time writing it up. Okay. So I'm going to do an exercise now. Uh, and the exercise is basically what's given in this uh, handout. So I have x, which is Gaussian distribution with mean x and covariance this. And I have b, which is a Gaussian distribution of mean 0 and covariance sigma b. and y is equal to ax plus b. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I'm using the small letter here, even though it's a random variable, because capital B is already used as a matrix throughout the class, so I have to use small letter. And I'm deeply unhappy about it, but I have to do it. Uh, I don't have any other option. Okay, so this x is a random vector, this b is a random vector, a is a constant matrix, a is not a random matrix, a is a constant matrix, I know what a is, and I have a observation y, which is ax plus b, and now the goal is, having known y, how can I, get an estimate of x, okay? So that's our goal. Get expected value of x given y. Actually, we also want covariance of x given y. Okay, so going back to these facts, what do we know? X and Y are jointly Gaussian, then linear combination is also jointly Gaussian, is also Gaussian. So here I have X which is Gaussian, B which is Gaussian, X and B are completely independent of each other, and Y is a linear combination of X and B, as a result of which Y is also Gaussian. Okay, so X, Y, and B, all three of them are jointly Gaussian random variable. X and B are independent. Y is a linear combination of two Gaussian distributed random vectors. So therefore, it's also a Gaussian distributed random vector. And they are all jointly Gaussian random vector. Consequently, all I need to do is figure out what expected value of X given Y is and covariance X given Y is. For this, I need to know what is the joint distribution. So the problem one is, what is the joint distribution of x comma y? So once I know the joint distribution, I can apply this formula right here, and I can get the value of expected value of x given y and covariance of x given y. 
So what all matrices do I need to know in order to compute this? I need to know mu y, I need to know mu x, I need to know this entire matrix. So basically I need to find out what these four matrices are, what this, not four, but actually this vector, this vector and these four matrices are going to look like. That's all I need to know. Okay, so mu x I already know, sigma x I already know. Uh, what I need to find out is this part, this part, and this part. I don't know these three, these three matrices. Sigma x y is by the way sigma y x transpose, so it's not that difficult. So what I need to do is compute these three things. So we'll do it uh, very quickly. So mu y, again don't, don't write it because it's there in the handout. So because I'm going to write a lot of equations, so I don't want you to get stuck in writing it up. right? So I want to find the expected value of y which is equal to the expected value of ax plus b. Now expectation is linear. What that means is expected value of x1 plus x2 equals to expected value of x1 plus expected value of x2. Because a is a constant I can take the a outside of the expectation because it, remember expectation is just an integral. So all I am doing is integrating this with respect to the joint distribution of x and b and you know that integral is a linear uh, like integral of f1 plus f2 is equal to integral of f1 plus integral of f2. We know that from calculus. So I'm using that uh, the same I, same logic here expectation is integral. I'm integrating two different functions. I'm integrating the sum of two functions which is equal to the sum of the integrals. And I'm taking the matrix A out because A doesn't, uh, A is a constant, so A can go out of the integral. And so all I'm left with is A, a times mu x. Mu x is the mean of x. Then I need sigma y y, which is, or sigma y, I don't know, y y, I'll just use y y. Maybe I'll put it x x b b. Yeah, I think let's just keep it like that, much easier. Okay. So this is a covariance of AX plus B, which is expected value of AX plus B minus A mu X ax plus b minus a mu x transpose. So remember covariance is uh, the random variable minus the mean times the random variable minus the mean transpose. So that's what I'm doing here. And I'll get a whole bunch of expressions here uh, after I uh, uh, expand it. So what I get is a expected value of x minus mu x, x minus mu x transpose, A transpose. So I'm collecting these two terms and I'm separating it out, so I get that. Then I have expected value of B B transpose plus, so I've collected this term separately and then I have the B, B terms and then I have a cross term. Okay, so I have expected value of B times
x minus mu x transpose a transpose and then plus. Now, which of these terms are cancelling out? Which terms are going to go to 0? Let us look at this term. What is this term equal to? No. So, this term is basically exactly the expression of sigma xx, this term. So, I have A sigma xx A transpose. Because remember, sigma xx is defined as expected value of x minus mean, x minus mean transpose. So, that is what gives me the first term. The second one is B minus 0, B minus 0 transpose. So, that is sigma BB. Now, look at this term. So, remember X and B are independent of each other. And what I have is uh, expected value of this random variable whose mean is 0, this random variable also whose mean is random vector whose mean is 0. And these two random vectors are independent of each other. So, that is 0. And by the same logic, this particular term is also 0. So, this is mean 0, this is mean 0. And they both are independent of each other. Therefore, their expected value is also going to be 0. They are uncorrelated random variables. Okay, They are independent of each other. Therefore, the expected value is going to be 0. So, this gives you the second expression, the equation number 2 in the handout. That gets us sigma y, sigma y y. So, let me write it down there. Can I raise this? Any question on this side? Okay. Sigma yx is expected value of ax plus b minus a mu x and then x transpose. No, x minus mu x transpose. I am going to do the same thing now. Uh, remember, these are the three unknown things. So, I have found out what this is. I have found out what this is. Now, I need to found, find out what sigma y x is. So, this sigma y x is y minus the mean. So, mean is a mu x. So, y minus the mean x minus the mean of x transpose. So, that is what I am doing here. And this is equal to a plus b which term goes to 0 here what is the first term Yeah, this is sigma xx, so I get A sigma xx plus, what about the second term? What, what is this term going to be? So, this is a zero mean random variable and this is also zero mean random variable because I am subtracting the mean from x, so then that becomes zero mean random variable and these two are independent of each other. So, the second term is actually going to be 0. So, that gives me the covariance of y comma x. Okay, That gives me the covariance of y comma x. Now, 
Remember what I wanted, what my goal is, my goal is to compute expected value of x given y and covariance of x given y. Now, what I have done is I have computed mu y, sigma y y and sigma y x. So I have computed all of these unknown things in this particular matrix. Remember sigma x y is just the transpose of this. It's just the transpose of sigma y x because this particular matrix is supposed to be a positive definite matrix, so it's symmetric. So this is transpose of this. So I get this. Now all I have to do is plug in these values right here and I get the value of expected value of y given x and I get covariance of y given x, okay? And that's given in equation six and seven in the handout, okay? I'm not gonna write that equation here. So just by plugging in all these values, you can, uh, in this particular expression. So remember, I'm, I'm here, I'm interested in expected value of x given y, whereas here I'm interested in y given x. So there's a slight change in notation, but otherwise you have to apply the same formula and you will get the answer to the question. So you will be able to get this value and this value. Okay, so why is this particular, uh, 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 sequence of uh, steps important? Well, <clears throat> many a times we are interested in x, but we cannot observe x, all we can observe is y, which is maybe some function of x, so in this case it's a linear function of x, and then there is some sensor noise. Uh, B is the sensor noise. And so what we want to do is we want to get an estimate of what x is based on the observations that I've made, which is y. So going back to the vehicle example, I need to know what the velocity of the vehicle is given the observations from the rotation sensors. Now sometimes you can have multiple sensors like in the previous class we had talked about five or six different ways of getting the velocity of the car. So what were those uh, different sensors? So one is rotation sensor of the, of the uh, vehicle tires. Uh, second one was GPS, third one was Anyone remembers? Camera, so you can look at the camera, the flow of the images in the, from the camera, and then you can use that to estimate the velocity. And then you can also use acoustics, uh, like the, not the acoustic sensor, but uh, uh, yeah, acoustic sensors can also be used in some way to deduce the velocity. It's not a very good sensor for deducing velocity, but you can also deduce velocity of the car. So you have like sensor readings from multiple sensors, and you want to know what the velocity of the car is. And as long as you have the joint distribution of what the, uh, what the error covariance looks like and what the uh, covariance of x looks like, and if you can write y equals to ax plus b, then by looking, by knowing what the, what a sigma bb, sigma xx and mu x is, you are able to figure out what the velocity of the vehicle is. Now remember that the difference now is, I mean, the, 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 so this one is easy to understand. This is something that you will study in all your statistics class. But remember that when we are talking about autonomous systems, the autonomous systems have a time component to it. So all of these measurements are being taken over time. Like you have the measurement now, and then we'll have the measurement one second later, and then we'll have the measurement two seconds later, and so on and so forth. So, it's not a static problem. Now this one, this whole sequence of steps seems to be a very static sequence of steps. So you kind of have all the readings at this point of time and you can find out what X is, but then you are going to get that reading again in one second. And after that time, you have to do the estimation of the velocity again. Why do you need velocity estimation? Well, because you need to show it on the dashboard to the driver. Or in the case of an autonomous vehicle, that velocity will then get fed into the computer, which will then decide, okay, this is what the vehicle needs to do. So what you have there is you get a sequence of observation. You have a control system, you get a sequence of observation, and now you need to estimate what the state is based on that sequence of observation. So you need to estimate what the velocity is as a sequence of observation. Now, of course, you can look at the current sensor reading and you can estimate what the velocity is going to be, but it would be prudent 
to make use of the fact that you have collected so much of data from the recent past, why not, why, why should we throw all that data? Why don't we use that data in order to compute what the velocity of the vehicle is? So that area uh, where you are using successive observations to estimate what the current state is, that, that area is called filtering. So it's, it's, it's an area called filtering and I want to get to filtering. I want to specifically talk about Kalman filter, which is a way to estimate the state, which is a dynamic uh, quantity. It changes at every point of time as a function of the sequence of observation you are getting. And the crux of that particular algorithm is basically what's there on the board. But there's a bit more, uh, a, a few more things to it, so which I want to get to in the next part uh, of this lecture. So any questions on this uh, derivation? Okay. So we know what are the important properties of Gaussian and we exploited that property to solve a simple problem of estimating x given y. Now let's talk about filtering and specifically we are going to talk about Kalman filtering algorithm. So I have a control system I have the observation so this is how my velocity is updating as a function of the previous velocity and the previous action and whatever noise there may be due to the road. So remember when we were talking about this uh, model for uh, model for vehicles, we were talking about different ways by which the noise comes into the picture. And then we have the observation noise. Uh, my x naught is a Gaussian random variable with mean whatever, mu x zero, mu zero, and covariance sigma zero. And my WT is, is Gaussian and these are all independent. Actually, I want to spend some time on talking about independence. Why should, uh, why should two random variables have dependence in these situations? Any thoughts? What could make two, ran two noises or two random variables very dependent in these situations? You know, it, going back to our discussion, whenever there is a fault in the system, it starts adding dependence. So if, uh, uh, so we are assuming that WT and VT, the observation noise and the uh, actuation noises are uh, independent of each other, but if the vehicle goes in the water, if the vehicle gets flooded, a lot of these independent assumption goes away because, they, because water introduces dependence among the two random variables who are supposed to be completely independent. So again, always remember that these are the assumptions, but there are situations. One, one thing you should always remember is uh, under what conditions would these assumptions fail, okay? And so the, the, in, the, in the context of autonomous systems, uh, many a times assumptions fails under certain fault or under certain environmental conditions. So vehicles are not supposed to go in the water, but if it is raining heavily and if the roads get flooded, and you are driving the vehicle in a, on a flooded road, uh, the water, if it goes into, uh, it adds to the uh, uh, drag on the vehicle, so it adds to WT, 
but it also adds to the sensor noise, either because of humidity or because of the entry of water into the sensors. And so it would make these things dependent in those situations. Okay. Now, what we are observing, all we are observing is yt. Okay, so I'm observing y0, y1, yt. And I want to get an estimate. The question is, estimate xt using y0 to yt and u0 to ut minus 1. This is the information. How should we go about doing it? So let's look at it. My x0, my x1 is ax1 ax0 plus bu0 plus w0 and my y0 is cx0 plus B0. This is Gaussian, this is Gaussian, this is a constant because U0 is something that the controller decides. So this is Gaussian, this is Gaussian. So what do I know about X1 and Y0? They are jointly Gaussian, okay? Because linear combinations of Gaussian distributions are Gaussian. So same thing goes for X2 and y1, these are all Gaussian, they, these are all jointly Gaussian random variables, uh, random vectors. So you start with this assumption of independent noises and independent initial state, and then what you get is a sequence of jointly Gaussian random variables. What does that imply about the question? Well, all that means is, if I need to estimate xt using all of this information, what I know is, number one, uh, xt given all this information is Gaussian. What else do I know? The other thing I know is xt given info is linear in info. So whatever expression I'm going to get for xt, it's going to be linear in this set of observations and the set of control actions that I'm taking. Okay, so we can find expected value of x0 given y0, right? We just uh, let's try to find out expected value of x1 given y1.
I'm trying to think what should we do. Maybe uh, let's do x naught given y naught. So this is mu zero plus sigma x a transpose a sigma x sigma x so i should use sigma 0 sigma 0 a transpose plus sigma v inverse y 0 minus c mu 0 this is using the handout by the way the equation 6 and 7 of the handout and then covariance of x0 given y0 is sigma 0 minus sigma 0 a transpose Okay, this comes from equation six and seven of the handout that I'd given you. We just solved this problem, right? Uh, y was ax equal ax plus b. So we just solved that problem. I'm just using the result from there uh, to get these expressions. Now, what I want to do is I want to find out what is the expected value of x1 given y0, u0, y1. Okay, so I need to know the mean and the covariance of this conditional mean and conditional covariance of x1 given the three random variables. Any idea how do we solve this problem? Any thoughts on how to solve this problem? Let's try to make it simpler, okay? Let's try to make it expected value of x1 given y0 and u0. Let's, let's look at it, okay? So this is equal to expected value of a x 0 b u 0 plus w 0 given y 0 and u 0. What do I get? I get a expected value of x 0 given y 0 u 0 plus b u 0 plus expected value of w 0 given y 0 u 0. Okay, is this step clear to everyone? I'm trying to solve a simpler problem. I don't want to go through the difficult problem of conditioning it on y1. So I'll try to solve a simpler one where I'm just conditioning it on y0 and u0. I'm not conditioning it on y1. And then I expanded the expression for x1 in this particular fashion. And I get this, this uh, equation what is this equal to? Let's try to think what expected value of W0 given Y0, U0. So is W0 influenced by Y0? Not really, because W0 is actually independent of all other random variables. So it is not influenced by Y0. Is W0 influenced by U0? It's not influenced by U0. So this is actually just the expected value of W0 
which is actually equal to zero. Remember, WT is a mean zero noise. So this one is equal to zero. What is this equal to? Is X not influenced by U zero? Is X not influenced by U zero? Not really. Actually, U zero is influenced by the estimate of I mean, y0, u0 is a function of y0 because you act, act based on the observation. So actually, u0 doesn't influence x0 at all. So this is just a times expected value of x0 given y0 plus bu0. And this is something we computed right here. Okay, so that's how we computed this particular conditional expectation. And I get the, uh, the, the ra random variable, the distribution of x1 given y0, u0. So I also need the covariance matrix. Once I know the expected value on the covariance matrix, and then I know y1, again, I observe y1 again, then I need to find out the conditional expectation and the conditional covariance again and again, right? So that's the sequence of activities that I have to do. So it turns out you can keep doing this again and again, and eventually uh, you will realize that there is a pattern that emerges out of this expression. So that's the usual principle of mathematical induction-based pattern. And then we are able to identify what that pattern is and get the answer to this particular question. So I'm going to write down what that pattern is. Can I erase this side of the board before? Any questions on this side? Questions? No? OK. So what is the pattern that emerges out of doing these lengthy estimation again and again? Well, the pattern is as follows. I get that x hat t plus 1, which is expected value of x t plus 1 given information. So information at t plus 1, whatever that information is, it's given by a x hat t plus b u t plus k t times yt plus 1 minus c a x hat t plus b u t. Okay, where kt is given by, let me use sigma t, sigma t, no, st, st times c transpose, c st c transpose, sigma v inverse, and st is covariance of xt given y0 to yt, u0 to ut minus 1. And this is given by, oh, st plus 1. Let's uh, keep it ST itself.
let's uh, dissect these equations a little bit. Okay, so here is what is happening. So I went through the entire process of again in, uh, of estimating the expected value of xt plus one given the information and the covariance of xt given all the information. So remember, this is the information at time t that I have. This is the information at time t. So I'm here, this information is at time t plus one info at t plus 1 and this is info at t information at time t so i want to find out the expected value of xt plus 1 given the information i have at time t plus 1 and i have the entire history history of information and i'm trying to condition on the entire history but it turns out that i don't need to keep the entire history in my memory remember that after 10000 seconds the memory requirement will be quite high for this particular uh, system. But it turns out that I don't need to keep so much, so many things in the memory. What I need is the current observation that I'm making, the previous estimate that I have done, the previous action that I have taken, and a bunch of matrices. And how do you compute those matrices? Well, this ST turns out to be the covariance of XT given all this information at time T. So, I keep track of a covariance matrix. I do some matrix manipulation in order to get this uh, gain KT, the observation gain. And then I use that in multiply it to, so this KT is basically something that appears linearly with respect to YT plus one and whatever estimate of the state and observation you have. So, we, we don't need so many things in the memory. We don't need to keep so many things in the memory. All we need to do is keep track of x hat t, keep track of ut, keep track of the current observation, and keep updating a bunch of matrices. So this matrix is easy to compute. This particular matrix has a bit of a funny thing going on. So this st minus one, the covariance at time t minus one, or rather I should say the conditional covariance, it gets multiplied by AA transpose, so it still remains, it can grow or shrink depending on what the eigenvalues of A looks like. Then I subtract a positive definite term from that particular term. So I get, I get a lower covariance. So this is my covariance. Then because I made the observation, my covariance is lowered. But then because, the, because of the noise, the covariance increases a little bit but I still need to keep the covariance matrix in my mind in order to compute the gain and those gain goes into this, uh, uh, this expression in order to compute the x hat t plus one. So this is known as a Kalman filter, uh, which is basically a recursive way of estimating what the state is based on the observations that you are getting. We are not dropping any of the observation in the process. We are not dropping, we are, comp uh, we are keeping track of all the observations that I've made so far in order to estimate XT. So I'm not using just the current sensor reading, I'm using the entire sensor history in order to compute the estimate. So certainly the estimate is much better in that case. And this is the estimation procedure for, uh, for estimating the state. Now the reason why Kalman filter is important and it'll become clear is uh, later on is you know, when you have multiple sensors to measure the same thing, like for the velocity of the vehicle, you have multiple sensors. How do you know if one of the sensor is attacked? So you look at the Kalman filtered value of the velocity, and then you see if a sensor reading is way off from that particular number, whatever the mean estimate is. So this is my estimate of the velocity. I'm looking at a sensor and it's giving me a very, very dif different reading of the velocity. So I know that this particular sensor has failed or the sensor has been attacked. Uh, and so then I will remove that sensor and redo the Kalman filter. Redo the entire Kalman filtering algorithm. 
without that particular sensor because I want to get a better estimate of the state because that feeds into my control algorithm. So that's where Kalman filtering becomes very useful because you have the pass. So, so imagine a sensor telling you that the velocity is 70 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, and suddenly it says, oh, the velocity is zero miles an hour in the next second. And you kind of know that the velocity cannot go to zero within a second. So then that means that this particular sensor needs to be moved away. I don't need to keep the reading of this sensor. And I'm going to recompute the velocity based on other information, other sensor readings that is provided to me. So that's the benefit of using Kalman filter. Uh, we'll revisit this particular topic again in a few days from now when we are talking about attack detection. But, uh, but uh, in the next class, I'm most likely going to do a presentation on what are the different types of attacks on autonomous systems. And then we'll talk about uh, 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 different types of viruses and worms and all that stuff on Friday's class. And next Monday, there is a presentation by the, the person who manages the entire cybersecurity of the entire OSU's building, building management system. So he's going to come and give you his perspective on how he thinks about the system as a whole, how he thinks about cybersecurity of all the building. So anyway, that's all we have. Thank you so much and we'll see you on Wednesday.